So welcome everyone to Startup Stories. My name's Siobhan Curran and I'm the manager of the University of Newcastle's Integrated Innovation Network. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're, um, we're coming to you from today, which is the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to uh, pay respects to um, traditional custodians of the lands on which people online might be joining us from. So if you want to hit us up in the chat and let us know which country you're joining us from, please do. Uh, it's always a delight to know where everyone's coming from over the online. It's very awkward, I have to say, looking up at this camera, making sure I'm acknowledging <laughs> our, our wonderful uh, guests online as well as the people in the room. Um, so sorry for the awkward head up, head down. Um, for those of you that are new to the i 2 n we're an initiative of the University of Newcastle. We sit within the Research and Innovation Division and we're responsible for entrepreneurship, enterprise skill development and new venture creation. Um, at the heart of the i 2 n is a strategic positioned innovation hub. It's opening in about six weeks time over at Honeysuckle, um, but um, we're coming to you live now from uh, the hub that currently sits within Hunter Street. Um, we do a series of connection events exactly like Startup Stories, plus a whole range of cohort-based programs that help emerging entrepreneurs, um, as well as our researchers, early stage researchers, that are trying to understand what their impact potential might be, uh, as well as pre-accelerator and incubation programs as well. So in just under four years of operation, with the support of the New South Wales Boosting Business Innovation Program, we've supported over 4,000 individuals, um, hundreds of businesses, um, as well as um, a number of startups that have generated revenue, over $6 million in funding raised. Um, they've created new jobs, work integrated learning opportunities for our students. Um, they've acquired customers, they've won awards, um, and they're developing products and solutions right here in the Hunter. And that's really the aim of the game for us here at the I2N is um, making some kind of um, headwind into diversifying the Hunter's economy um, through new businesses that leverage technology to be able to scale and go global and stay headquartered right here in the Hunter. Um, so a little outline of this morning's event. Um, we have taken a number of questions from registrants online. Um, some of you might be in the room here. So we've collated those and sort of themed them into some, some topics. Um, we're going to, after uh, the presentation from our speaker this morning, we're gonna go through some of those online questions before we open it up to the floor, as well as to our participants that are online. Um, so feel free in the chat um, online, if you wanna uh, type in your questions as, you, as the presentation goes along, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, for those of us that are joining us online, um, sorry, for those of us that are joining in person, if there's an emergency, we just scoot out that door and go to the left. If you're at home, hopefully you know the drill where your emergency exit is. Um, uh, but now onto our guest. So for those um, of you who um, ha may have seen Shark Tank or a serious serial follower of the show. Uh, our next guest won't be so much of a surprise to you, uh, but we're so thrilled to be able to welcome Jennifer Holland, who's the founder of Holland Healthcare, a global med tech company and the inventor of the throat scope. Um, Jennifer's innovation journey started in 20, 2009 when she quickly uh, realized a doctor holding a pen light uh, and a wooden tongue depressor with a moving young child was not the best way to diagnose a throat infection. Um, and by 2010, she'd created a prototype of an all-in-one illuminated tongue depressor and has since then gone from strength to strength, receiving accolades from the Queensland government, Shark Tank investor, Steve Baxter, and many more. Jennifer's gone on to build a strong team that is scaling the company across the US, Japan, and Europe, and they have attracted global recognition. They hold numerous patents and have distributed over 2 million products across eight countries via 30 medical distribution partners. Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us for Startup Stories. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's uh, great to be here and um, back in my uh, hometown of Newcastle. So uh, uh, look, I, I want to start by just sharing a little bit more about my background. Uh, I was born deaf. I spent many years working on my speech and hearing. I was bullied in high school. I moved out of home at 16, completed year 11 and 12 in one year at TAFE, worked two jobs while studying uh, via distance education at Charles Sturt University, started my first business at 19, purchased my first house at 19, was married at 24. I had my first child at 25 and I went on to start Holland Healthcare at 27. 
Over the past 11 years, our medical devices have won awards in Sydney, Las Vegas, New York. I've won $100,000 from Amazon. I've pitched to billionaires. I've been invited to pitch at the White House. I've spent time with Steve Forbes at the Forbes headquarters in New Jersey. I became an advisor to the American Teledentistry Association. I've been on CBS, CNBC, and most importantly, I've invented medical devices and software that are used by medical and dental professionals all over the world. So 11 years ago, I made the decision to become an entrepreneur. I've learned many things throughout this time and I'm still learning every day about people, about life and about time. The only thing I know is that ideas can come from anyone at any time. And what you need to succeed is inside you. If you have the ability to believe, act, persist. So how did it all begin? Well, it was one simple idea and the belief that I could. In 2010, I took my baby 15 month old to the doctors. He seemed to be suffering from a sore throat. So the doctor got out his wooden tongue depressor and his handheld flashlight. And he asked me to restrain my child by placing one hand around his arms and one hand around his forehead. He then tried to open his mouth with the wooden tongue depressor. Well, that was my moment. That was my moment when I thought there must be a better way and a simpler solution. I built my first prototype in the garage cost me $2.50. It was an LED torch taped to a piece of plastic and it, the light refracted through the plastic to come out the end. I had invented orifice illumination. This simple solution laid the foundation for 16 patents that Holland Healthcare currently holds today. When I was presented with a problem, I found a solution without any experience with no money, but I believed I could, so I did. From here, I built eight different throat scope prototypes and every four to six months, I went into a doctor's clinic. I asked the doctor to examine me with my prototype. And every time I walked out pretty disheartened. That was the best I could do at the time, trying to get validation for the product. So you can imagine Five years later, when I walked in with a prototype and the doctor said, wow, this is amazing. Where do I buy one? That was the moment. Validation had come. It was time to act. So action, acting, because no one's going to do it for you. You sit around waiting, no one will do it for you. Until you take action to turn your idea into reality, it is worth nothing. Action leads to opportunities. And one of my favorite opportunities to talk about is Shark Tank. In 2015, after many failed investor presentations, meetings with large medical device companies, I finally had run out of money. I remember one night sitting on the lounge watching TV and an advert popped up, calling all inventors for a new television show coming soon to Channel 10. I thought, challenge accepted. So I filled out the paperwork that night and I had no idea of what the show was going to be or how it was going to go down. I remember the next morning I got a phone call from the Shark Tank producers. I had started the process for the Shark Tank show and after a couple of months, I went through to the audition round. After many phone calls and many different um, business, I guess, questions coming from uh, the producers, I'd finally got the call to say that I was up to go against the Sharks. At this time, I still had no idea that it was going to be the Shark Tank show. So I'd researched different shows that were on television at the time, and there was Dragon Den, Dragon's Den in the UK and Shark Tank in the US. I was very, I was hoping that it was going to be Shark Tank because I loved the idea of the sharks being up there and going in and pitching. And I felt like it was a, a bit more of a comfortable setting compared to the Dragon's Den setting. So 
What did I do to prepare? I actually over-prepared for Shark Tank. I watched 108 episodes of the US Shark Tank. I had 85 questions written down that I knew that there were possible questions that they would ask me. I knew how they, I would answer those questions. This may sound weird, but I did have a photo of every single shark up in my kitchen. And every time I was having, making food in, or preparing food in the kitchen, I was saying hello to them. The reason I did this is because I was walking into a scenario where I had no idea how I was going to react or feel. I'd never been on television before. Having a whole room of television staring at me, I wanted to be comfortable in that situation. I knew what every shark had, had ate for breakfast. I knew exactly what they liked to invest in. I knew how, they, how many people, how many children were in their family. I knew everything about them. And that gave me the confidence to go in there. It almost felt like when I did walk in that I knew them. My game plan was easy. I'd worked out a strategy. I knew 120 people were gonna be pitching to the sharks. I knew that 80 companies would only air on television. And I knew that I, my goal was to air on television. I knew that if I got a yes for a deal, I should say yes, because on the backside, I didn't have to go through with it. So my goal was to say yes to a deal if I got through because I knew that I would get onto television. And I didn't want to go through all of this hassle just to not get on television. So I, I walked in and I remember standing about to walk through to meet the sharks. And I had my six-year-old son next to me and I froze. They changed my pitch right before I walked in. I had practiced the pitch for three months in the shower, everywhere you can imagine, driving the car, making lunches, everywhere. Um, and right at the last moment, they changed the pitch. My son was standing next to me and he, I looked down at him and he said, if you can do this, if you can look after four kids, you can walk in there and talk to these sharks. And it was that moment that I thought, you know what, I have nothing to lose. And the doors opened and in we walked. I was in there for two hours. I was pitching for two hours. You saw 12 minutes. It was a long process. It took a long time, but it was the meeting that you see on television. Some of it is edited, but it, we were not interfered with by any television producers or anyone. It was just a conversation between five sharks and one entrepreneur. So I was lucky enough to land the deal with Steve Baxter. Steve believed in me and what he gave me was confidence. Confidence in what I was doing that was going to, you know, that, that I could do it as well. And the belief continued in what I was doing. Because of my actions that led to this opportunity, I, I then found that one advisor who gave me confidence to continue on my journey. This opportunity changed the course of my business forever. The doors that were shut were now opening. The doors that were once never even considered to open were starting to open, but not only open, they were coming to me. So, can you, sorry. Oh, thank you. So the next ingredient that I always say for success is actually persistence because nothing is done um, without persisting at it and working hard. No matter the knockbacks, and I've had a million, Remember, the faster you rise, the faster you find the next opportunity, and that's the one that could change your life forever. In 2016, we secured a major distribution deal with CVS. We were rolling out in 5,000 CVS pharmacies in America. It had taken over a year to secure this deal, and everyone was extremely excited, and we received our first purchase order for 50,000 throat scopes. We had a strict deadline to be stocked in 23 distribution centres around the US by, I think it was the 15th of July. And on the 2nd of July, I actually received a throat scope prototype to our warehouse in Redhead. The prototype was tested by one of our employees at the time and the light was not correct, it was wrong. The Lux reading, when we pulled out the light reader, was reading 1,000 Lux. 
it was supposed to be sitting at 8,000. We opened up the throat scope handle and we realized that the light or the LEDs that they had used on the PCB board were incorrect and they'd used a cheaper version. I knew at that moment, as I fell to the floor, that that deal was not going to happen. And I, I felt, you know, this, this urge to, to want to make something happen, to try and get it out there, to try and continue on. But I knew that if I did that, it would ruin the brand because it was a significant difference in a light inside the mouth and the light output. The next morning I rang CVS. I told them the situation. I was completely transparent with my partner and I told them that we could not deliver the stock. I made the gut-wrenching decision to actually pull the stock and the 50,000 units, which were currently in two containers on a ship heading to the US, basically were stopped in transit and they were turned around as soon as they received, were received at the Los Angeles um, port. This was a really difficult decision and one that I believe was the right decision at the time. Uh, I, a year later, I persisted knocking on the CVS door to get us back in and to get that deal over the line again. It took a long time for them to trust us again even though we were transparent. But in 2017, in August, we rolled out in 5,000 stores across America. And it was the persistence that paid off in the end because I was there, I was transparent. I was continuously knocking on their door going, come on, give us another shot. If I had have given up because they didn't reply to my email, if I had have given up because they didn't accept my call when I was calling, I wouldn't be sitting here now. After many months of knocking on that door, it opened again. And after two years in the making, we finally rolled out. So the ingredients to success are easy. Believe, act, persist. Believe in yourself and your ability to achieve it. Find others that believe in you as well. Act because no one will do it for you and persist because today's no is tomorrow's yes. Thank you. That's a great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> you can just feel the passion, can't you? It's so inspiring. Um, you actually remind me a lot of my sister, although she's an entrepreneur as well. And um, just your energy and your can-do attitude is just absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, congratulations on your success. I think what the example that you just provided at the end there around persistence is just really inspiring. So mm. congratulations on where you've gone to. Um, so I'm going to um, just start off with a couple of questions from mm -hmm. the people who had um, asked questions um, at the very beginning um, during registration. So this is around a theme of emerging entrepreneurs. We have a lot of them here in the Hunter, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people with really great ideas, but they're just not sure what the first step might be. Um, can you share any advice for founders wanting to engage with investors for the first time? Okay, so there's a couple of different types of investors. I think there's the... Uh, the investors that are very drawn to wanting to be a part of your story, and it all comes down to when you engage investors, is understanding what they're looking for. Ask questions. Don't just go in there and pitch to them and assume you know what they want. Actually ask them before you pitch to them what they're looking for in an investment, what they like to see when you're pitching. But most importantly, when someone, when you're up there pitching, understand which investor you're talking to. Some of them are actually wanting to share the journey and the story with you and others just want to see the projected financials and make sure you're going to get to your exit strategy in five years. So I think it's all about understanding who you're pitching to and don't be afraid to ask questions before you pitch. Um, Professor Will Rivkin at the University of Newcastle asks, what are critical skill sets that you realised that you did not have after you either developed or were able to recruit onto your team? 
So early on, I realised that uh, missing the, one of the missing links in our team was not having medical and dental experience. So those five years in research and development where I was producing prototypes, I was on my own. And I was using um, avenues to go into GP clinics, making appointments and asking them to try the product on me. That's where walking into Shark Tank, Steve made me realise that I needed dental and medical advisors on to actually, um, you know, help me and, and um, develop the product, but also uh, guide me in the medical and dental uh, industries. Um, and this is something I had no experience in. So we built a very strong advisory board team um, and we based, you know, a lot of those advisors on sort of a milestone agreement where they helped us or gave us time every month and they would then be open to getting options in the company. Ralph Kenke, he's a lecturer at the University of Newcastle, asks, how do you attract and convince investors to commit at the early stage of a startup? So I think it is all about your story. You need to be a good storyteller. If you give a great pitch telling them exactly why you're doing it, the problem, what you're solving, how you're solving it and what's in it for them, and you can do that and articulate it in two minutes, but tell it in a way that it's a story and you're going to take them on this journey, you will every time win over someone in the crowd. That's actually a common theme that we hear a lot. Um, it's not just about the facts and the figures, but mm. that storytelling element as well is really important. Um, Peter McKinnon, who's a doctor at Omnia Wheel asks, uh, what were the key turning or change points along the way? Or what key learnings can you share? Uh, I think, you know, for me, it was definitely persistence. So it was understanding that you don't take things personally. Everything is business is business. Um, you know, decisions are made for different reasons and it's, it's not a personal um, attack of you. It is actually just a business decision. So early on, I, I would take things personally. I would show more emotion in my business. Uh, and now I, I realise, and even, you know, five years ago, I started to realise that everything is rela in relation to business. And, you know, if you step away and look back at that, it all comes down to persisting as well, because so many times I've been knocked back. So many times I've been told no. But you know what? Ask the question why. It's that simple. So many people get discouraged when someone says no to them. They never go and try to open that door again. I can tell you a story about when I first came and pitched to um, Kemma, Kemma, Chemists here in Australia. I went to the CEO. He said no. Six weeks later, I was still looking on LinkedIn, using LinkedIn as the best avenue to connect with CEOs and different people across different industries. And I noticed that there was a changing of the guard of the CEO at Kenmark. Well, guess what? I knocked on his door six weeks later <laughs> and I got into Kenmark Chemist. And it's because I don't accept no. <laughs> Ask that, why. Yeah, and I, I love that call to action at the end there because when you're talking a lot about persistence, there's also a lot of resilience that mm. comes with that. Um, this isn't one of the questions asked, but I'm really curious to know, how do you maintain that level of resilience in the face of no? And, yeah, can you provide us some insight on what goes through your mind? Obviously, there's a little bit of disappointment at the beginning, but then what happens? <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I think you, you know, after a while of getting knocked down, you go, oh, hang on, I got back up faster that time and I found another opportunity and, you know, I'm going to try this avenue or, you know, I'm going to try pitching to this investor or presenting to this medical device company. Um, it's, it's all a mindset. If you tell yourself that you're going to get up fast next time you get knocked down, you will do that. And every time you do it, you will get up faster and faster and faster. And then one day when you have a phone call and they say no, and you've put months of your time into, you know, having or working out a relationship with someone or a partnership, and they ended up saying no to you, you'll hang up the phone and go, okay, next one. And it'll be that simple. It's all a mindset and everyone has the ability to do it. Um, this is more now around the theme of technology. Uh, you're working in a really highly regulated, challenging industry that is mm -hmm. health tech. Um, this is a question from Phoebe Hallett, who's a student at the University of Newcastle. And she's asking, I'm studying medical engineering and would like to know how you gain the skills to prototype your inventions. <laughs> That is a great question. Uh, I, I had no skills um, in engineering, electrical design, um, electrical engineering. Uh, Google, Google taught me everything I know. Um, and 
I, I also partnered with different people who did have experience as well, which was part of it. But um, I learned from the ground up. I had no idea what a PCB was before I started. I had no idea, you know, of different LED lights or batteries or any, or how the circuit board would work. Um, you know, different plastics from um, injection molding through to tooling through to different plastics that would create different, you know, light refraction. Um, you know, all of this I learned and taught myself online. And I think that as an entrepreneur, we are so lucky to have all the information at our fingertips. There is no reason or excuse why you can't research and become an expert in the field. And, you know, the other side to it is partnering with people that have the experience already if you're not willing to go and do it yourself. Peter Morrissey, who's joining us here um, from Huntinet, has asked, how has your manufacturing procurement and process changed as you've scaled nationally and internationally? So we actually... Um, got two new medical um, manufacturing plants set up in China and uh, we bought tooling over to America and we started to look at different manufacturing options over there as well. Um, it's difficult when you're scaling to kind of run as fast as you're actually the demand is for the product. But if you foresee it coming, I think that's one of the things that you need to sort of start looking at early on and making sure you have options. It took a long time to find the manufacturing partners that we do have and have reliable partners um, you know in other countries and making sure that they were up and running it's also about you know when you're running batches making sure that someone's representing your company over there if you don't have your own plant set up and you are relying on someone who's um, subcontracted to you um, there's a lot of different processes involved um, you know in the manufacturing side where you need to you know be involved in the process Lucky for me, I've been involved all the way through and um, I'm a hands-on CEO. So I've been, you know, working with the people who are producing. Um, I've been over to China. I was there when they made the first tooling. I think this is important too as a leader and as an entrepreneur to understand the full process. And once you know that, it's easy for you to understand how you can scale it and grow. So I'm assuming the uh, first provider of the 50,000 units is no longer? Correct. <laughs> Peter, I'll just um, hand you the mic if that's okay. Sorry, just so the people at home can hear. What did you learn and what did you do with that 1,000 lux LED? Uh, <laughs> I bombed it on the way out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but um, uh, no. So basically, yeah, we turned it around. We actually bought the, the units back to Australia and they were sitting in a warehouse, but we ended up donating 50,000 units over to the countries that needed some lighting for dental um, and oral health purposes over in some, some third world countries. So that's where they ended up. And um, we... We went through a pretty tough process in that manufacturing time. I actually brought on a one of my shareholders I knew who had experience in manufacturing. So I brought him into the business full time. Um, and he's been a, a big mentor of mine, but also a great advisor. But he had a connection in China and um, he went over there and actually found us a new manufacturing plant. Very quickly, we got the tooling, picked it up, stormed the castle, so to speak, got the tooling, moved it over to a new manufacturing plant and had it set up and running over there. So um, what happened in the process is they just decided to use a different LED um, and they put it in the product and they didn't think that we would notice or they didn't think that we would, it would matter. Um, but it did matter significantly when it was, you know, a product to light up inside the mouth. So we um, spoke to that manufacturer and we just sort of had it out, I guess. Um, and, you know, we, were, we walked away, both of us walked away and just decided that it was a better fit. We put specifications in place. So we actually worked a lot on the back end of our processes, making sure that every single detail of the product was listed, who we wanted that supplier to be and what those different products should all be listed under. And that was something we didn't have set up prior to what happened with those 50,000 units and something that's really important. And I can't stress enough when you don't have a manufacturing plant that you're there running every day and you can't be there to see it, um, have, making sure that everything is in writing and everything is very 
you know, finally detailed in your agreement with them as well. Jennifer, I've got a question for you about um, the impact that COVID's had on, on manufacturing and, um, you know, factories having to close down in certain countries because of um, trying to contain the virus, for example, mm -hmm. um, whether or not you've encountered any supply chain issues as a result of that, but also um, have you given some thought to, there's a lot of talk about building up Australia's sovereign capability to be able to do a lot more manufacturing here in Australia. Mm -hmm. Has that impacted your, your thoughts or views on that at all? So uh, last year we were impacted with COVID. So our manufacturing plants were told not to produce anything else outside of PPE. Uh, so we, a lot of um, our the businesses that we we're working with and our partners were all closing down. Sales reps were grounded. Um, this is mainly when I talk, I'm always talking about the US. Um, that's where our main business is located. Uh, so we had to work out how to get around that. So what we did, a lot of the stock that we had here in Australia, we sent directly to the US. Um, we found very quickly another China uh, manufacturing plant who weren't um, co also contracted to the Chinese government so that we knew that we could start production very quickly. We moved one of the sets of tools to America so that we could have another plant set up very quickly if we needed to. Uh, and we basically, you know, reinvented our manufacturing process last year again. So it was kind of like the third time round. Um, we knew a lot of what we were doing, so it was it was a lot faster this time. Uh, but yeah, we I, I guess it's about you know finding a solution and acting as fast as possible to get you up and running because you don't want it to affect your partners and your customers. Lucky for us, a lot of our partners stop ordering because they were closed or they weren't out there selling anymore or schools, hospitals and clinics were all closing down and not work operating anyway. So we knew we had a bit of a window to get ourselves set up, ready to go when things opened up again. And that was probably the saving grace. I've got a question, some questions here now about the business itself. Mm -hmm. This is from Trevor Stewart, who's the regional manager at AI Group. And he's asking, what was your moment of luck that contributed to the realization of a commercially viable product? Huh, that's, a, that's a hard one. Uh, I guess it was the moment when I uh, talked about, you know, going into the doctor's clinic and it was the wow moment. Um, you know, I believe, I, I, Everything that we produce and all of the products that we have have all been built around the need for a customer to have a better product in a simpler form. And that's what we create. We're simple, we're affordable um, and multifunctional. So basically the customer was key in you know, learning that the validation, I guess, came for our product. And that's where we knew that we were, had that kind of wow factor ready to move forward. Yeah, and you often find that um, like the customer being your child, mm. you know, or that you as a carer wanting a better experience for your uh, your child in having to undertake those kinds of um, procedures. Um, but then there's also the doctor as well. Mm. What was the biggest challenge about getting, so you've got your like, your beneficiaries, which are, you know, the child who's going to have a better experience, um, but then you've got the the person who's going to use it isn't necessarily the person who's going to buy it or be able to buy it. So how do you navigate, how did you navigate finding out who the decision maker was in the business, particularly when you're trying to get it in the hands of actual doctors, as opposed to, you know, a chemist warehouse or something mm. like that, like a retail chain operator? So our focus was always around GPs in Australia. Uh, early on, I realised that they weren't the early adopters to the market. So I was testing different markets along the way from dentists through to dental hygienists, nurses, um, you know, GPs, speech pathologists. And the leader for us, our early adopters were speech pathologists. Um, so, you know, it wasn't who I thought it would be when we first set out. And, and that all comes around, you know, pivoting and working out where your early adopters are because your business model might change very quickly. And if you can, um, you know, it doesn't always, if you follow the path that your business model is the only way, you're going to have a lot of problems and you're going to have a lot of challenges. You need to understand that it's not always going to be the way that you think it's going to be when you set out. 
Um, I've got a question here from Glenn Downey, who's the managing director at the Maltby Group, and he's asking, what role, if any, have mentors played in your endeavour? Has the type of advice and capability sought and offered changed much over the course? So absolutely. So over 11 years, um, we've had different mentors and advisors and some play a, a really, you know, great role at the time, but you do change, you grow and you move into different areas. I mean, we, we were going from um, a medical device that could simply illuminate inside the mouth. Now we have a product for telehealth and I'm now, you know, we have an app out there. So, and it's for telehealth. So we've changed over time and um, it's important to understand which advisors are going to suit your needs now and then move on from them and find new ones that will actually suit your business as you grow as well. Um, a couple of the advisors that I have now and mentors have been with me the whole way through. And I think that the best ones are the ones that have the experience and the stories to tell you and you take away what you need so that you can take the advice and use it how you want to. So are a lot of those mentors and advisors investors in the business? Absolutely. And what about non-investors? What sort of, what type of advisors and mentors do you have in that capacity? Uh, so I don't have, uh, that's a good question. We have, uh, just trying to think. Yes, no, we do have advisors and mentors in the medical and dental space that aren't actually invested in the business. Um, and we work with them more so on a charity base. So they'll help us with advice. And in return, they actually like to donate different products or stock through to their charities. Um, so that's another way that we do have um, advisors set up if they don't want to be invested in the company or, um, you know, for medical reasons, they may not be able to um, be seen to be endorsing a product or a shareholder of the business. So a way that we get around to that is we actually donate um, through. So we've actually got an accredited head and neck training course with Dr. Richard Gallagher here in Australia. It's two CBD points for GPs. Um, and basically it's, it's showing GPs how to screen the head and the neck for the early signs of head and neck cancer. Um, we're actually rolling out at GPCE next week with Dr. Richard, who will be doing the workshops. Now with him, we actually donate back to St. Vincent's Hospital. Um, and that's how we work together with him. He, he loves the, the telescope and he uses it during his examinations and what he's doing, but you can't seem to be, you know, endorsing anything. So basically a way around that is actually working with them if they have an organisation that they like to donate to and um, setting up your relationship that way so that you can get their advice, their feedback on your products. Um, and then also, you know, you're giving back to what they believe in. That's a really great um, bit of insight there. Um, I've got a question here from Greg Langley, who's the founder at Greenbean. And they're asking, what was an obvious moment where you realized you were moving from startup to scale up? Can you share any advice on transitioning and the new challenges that arose? Uh, yes, there's many challenges. <laughs> I think one of the biggest challenges is actually, um, you know, your employees and, and setting up the business in a way where you have trustworthy employees. I think that's something that we've struggled with a lot. Um, we're all remotely located, so you have to place a lot of trust in your employees, particularly when you're growing. You need to make sure that they're doing, um, you know, what you need them to do. And I guess, you know, there's so many different challenges as you, you go along the journey um, from startup to scale up. But I, I see this as one of the biggest ones because it is time consuming. One, if you find a good employee going through that whole process to find them but then you've also got to realize that in your in your business you need to hire fast and fire fast so um, otherwise you're going to waste a lot of time and 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 that's what we do so we um we we've learned the hard way on that side and I would just say yes definitely in that process just figure it out quickly so can you provide any insight then on how you're able to communicate the company values. We talk a lot about culture and how important that is in a scale up, scale up business. So employees, new employees, particularly when you're hiring them at speed and at a high volume, are really able to you know understand and then behave in a way that aligns to the to the company's values and culture. Have you had to do a lot of work around being able to communicate that to to your employees? 
Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's about, um, you know, it, it's difficult to try and do that. We've hired two new people uh, in the US in the last couple of months, and I've had to do that. One of them is our president of the US company. Um, and I've had to do that remotely. I haven't been able to uh, be over there to interview him. It's been very difficult. Um, and, and this has probably been the hardest time because normally I would be over there, I would be interviewing them in person. I'm a very hands-on CEO. I, I know how our orders are packed and sent out. Um, I know how they arrive to a customer and I have always been very hands-on. So it has been a really big learning curve in the last couple of months, having to you know, hire a president from afar. Um, but it came down to a connection and a cultural fit. So what, what we did was I actually gave him an opportunity to be interviewed by each and every one of our employees from the administration assistant through to our VP of sales. And I asked the administration assistant how she was treated on that call with him on a one-on-one. -on -one. That, that was my deciding factor in him being put on. She was very, um, he, she, she, she said that he, he felt warm and he felt like he fitted the culture and it was a great conversation. And that was the deciding factor for me. If you treat someone who is, you know, sort of, you know, um, I guess that grounding force in your business, the same as you would treat the head of the company, then my belief is that's the right person or fit for your company. Um, I think there should be more of that. 360 interviews <laughs> in, uh, in companies. I think that's a really great insight. Um, we've got a question here from Dan Linsell at CSIRO and they're asking, uh, what was it like being an early stage founder and featuring on Shark Tank and how did it change your business trajectory? So you've touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but you're on, Steve Baxter's take, you said yes, what happened next? Uh, so, okay, great, great question. Um, so it's not what you see. Um, so basically, uh, I think when I went into the tank, I knew that if I dropped my valuation and I had, I think it was $30,000, I asked for $276,000 valuation. Um, and basically, uh, I knew that if I dropped it, that I would be better chance of getting a yes or a deal and therefore I would get on television. The whole point of what we did and what was going on in Shark Tank is it's a marketing avenue for you. It provides you with credibility and it's, it's worth, you know, um, thousands of dollars in marketing for free. I mean, it didn't cost me anything. It cost me my time, which is yes, your greatest asset, but ultimately no money was, um, you know, when you run out of money, that was my option. Uh, so, you know, on the back end of the Shark Tank deal, we actually walked out of the tank and Steve Baxter said to me, you need a team behind you, you can't do this alone. And that's when I realised that I needed those medical and dental professionals and advisors. But I also um, had a, an investment or a corporate director that I was talking to, who's our corporate director now, Dave Toomey. And I started chatting to him and he said, look, um, you know, the deal's probably not going to go through with Steve because I think you need a really a, a better business model on the back end. Let's work together to build that. So I offered him a milestone deal and he got 10% of the business based on different milestones and capital raises that he had to achieve. He also then brought on another person called Charles Cornish, who became my corporate director. And he worked on the commercialization and helped me with the experience that I needed to work out how to navigate the medical industry and get distribution deals over the line. Again, he was set up on a structure where it was uh, milestones for equity. So once I had those two team members, the deal didn't go through with Steve on the back end. But we marched back into, as a team of three, we marched back into Steve Baxter's office in Queensland. We got him as an investor in the company for 5% at a $2 million valuation. And he is still an investor in this company now. <laughs> so it's all about swinging it back around, I guess. At the end of the day, I knew that the deal that what I was walking in there with was ultimately not 
not the goal of what I wanted to achieve. Um, and on the back end of that, I knew that, you know, I still wanted to have Steve in the company because he brings that credibility uh, and he gave me the confidence, more confidence. Uh, so, you know, it's all about, uh, I guess, um, persisting again. And um, when you hear a no, go and ask why and then go turn it back around into a yes. Um, there's a couple more questions here around challenge management. Mm -hmm. I like that theme, actually. Richard made that one up. Challenge management. So how did you, this is actually from Raylene Bock, who's from Beyond Your Ordinary, asking, mm -hmm. how did you create the pathway to find the relevant people and resources you needed? Um, how much could you plan out and how much was just figuring it out in the moment? <laughs> <laughs> So a lot of what I did early on was figuring it out in the moment. Um, I think about 95% of the people that I've reached in the US has been because of LinkedIn. I have reached out to CEOs on LinkedIn. Um, that's how a lot of the doors that open for us and a lot of the companies and businesses that we work with and partner with today have been because I cold called them on LinkedIn. So I would basically go into a LinkedIn profile, look at what their interests are, send them a message and try to connect with them. Once they connected, I would ring them. I would email them until they answer. And this is where a lot of people give up. This is the persistence and the action that I'm talking about. A lot of people will send one email, one message, and they will not do it again. And I just think it's that persistence and the action of continuing to pressure them. And let's face it, the worst they can say is leave me alone. Mm. Okay, sure. I'll talk to you in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie Albert from the co-work space asks, were there any challenges that you felt were specific as a female entrepreneur? Ah, look, there are a lot of challenges. Um, I think, you know, you could get bogged down in thinking that things are personal, but at the end of the day, business is business. If someone wants to do a deal with you, they'll do the deal with you. And if they don't, they don't. Um, as a female founder, it is difficult and you can get stuck, um, you know, in that emotional headspace thinking that you're disadvantaged from it, but just keep it on that top level and don't get caught in the weeds. That's the most important part. Um, there's a question here from uh, Phil Island at Hone Carbon. What were the challenges around supply chain and how did you manage them? So we talked specifically about um, the growth stage and then last year with the pandemic. Are there any other um, areas of supply chain issues that you highlight? Yeah, so basically um, we set up based around a distribution model. Um, so we leverage a lot of distribution partners that actually pick up our product either from China or from our US warehouse or from our Australian warehouse um, or from our uh, European warehouse. And basically the product then goes out from there. Um, we worked with the distribution partners because it was an easier model than us trying to fulfill singular orders through direct customers. Uh, and that's that's kind of how we've got around it so far. Um, what was it? Supplier chain. Oh yeah. So basically, it's it's setting up a good distribution model, leveraging your dis different partners, um, and the the chain that they have set up. The best scenario is actually getting it picked up from your Chinese warehouse because you avoid a lot of um, logistical issues and nightmares. Got a question here from Steph Hodgson at Consult Med, and they're asking, what is the biggest challenge facing healthcare entrepreneurs in 2021? Yeah, okay, so uh, there's a lot of challenges, but I think the one thing that you need to think about when you're going into um, healthcare is telehealth is the future. Medi a lot of medical devices, a lot of software are become, going to become obsolete. They're not going to exist. You need to make sure that you're producing products that are actually based on the consumer because we're moving into the consumer world of medical examination. We're no longer doing traditional methods where medical and dental professionals have been trained to examine people. We're asking someone with no experience to examine themselves or their child or a patient. So you need to think about that. And as we head into the future, I think that's the most important thing to understand about creating something that will be around for a long time. 
And I suspect the um, lockdowns of 2020 have really opened up telehealth as an a mate. It's always been there, but it's it's exploded, right? And Absolutely. now now practitioners actually have practice doing it. It's probably less afraid and more inclined to want to embrace it. So it seems like a really great opportunity and mm -hmm. something someone savvy like you has obviously already well understood and is, is uh, exploring. Yeah. I've got two questions from online and then we're going to wrap up. Um, Claire online is saying such an amazing and inspiring presentation. Thank you. In the early days when creating first prototypes, when did you take out first IP protection and how comfortable were you with bringing on other people with the skills you didn't have? and sharing your ideas? So maybe the IP question first. Yeah, so IP, um, we currently hold 16 patents, 18 trademarks, six design patents. Uh, so back in 2010, when I created the first um, lighted tongue depressor, which was the LED torch taped to a piece of plastic, I had actually researched the eight existing patents uh, that were on tongue depressors. And I realized a fiber optic cable was used uh, to create light illumination inside the mouth and provide people with one hand free. But what they couldn't do in the market when I researched is they couldn't actually compete with the price of a wooden tongue depressor. So I, with through my research, I realized that was what was needed. So when I um, created the first prototype and realized the transparent plastic or the light refracted through it, providing the light inside the mouth, that was the moment that I put the IP down on the product and on the actual um, refraction of light through plastic. So it was probably about six months in because I had a very early prototype in the beginning of 2010. So we're about 10 years down the track now from my first patent. Um, and the other follow on question from that was how comfortable were you bringing on other people with the skills you didn't have in sharing your ideas? Yeah, look, it is hard and it's about finding a fit. Not everyone will fit or understand your vision or your passion or your story. Um, I believe it's about finding people who believe your story. If you, if you talk about your why and they're intrigued, they're the sort of people that you want to be working with. Um, we have, you know, people who are highly motivated and highly passionate because they believe every day in what they're doing. You need to find those people. And it is hard. It isn't easy. But keep searching because they are there. Um, this last question, um, I don't have a name, but great presentation. They're in caps, so they're very excited, this message. <laughs> great presentation. Congratulations. We understand that this is always hard work and honesty with investors and staff. Uh, might be more of a statement than a question, but um, honesty, I'm, I'm guessing how integral is honesty with Absolutely. investors and your staff? Oh, look, it is, um, it's paramount. You, you, you have to be, have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with everyone in the business. Um, and, and that's what I think builds that trustworthy team. And uh, if you lose track of that and side of that, and I know a lot of CEOs do, you, you tend to lose the, the, the feel of your company and you drift. And I think that if that happens, then that's when things start to go wrong. I think that's a really great point to finish off with. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Okay. We've absolutely loved having you here. Best of luck with the business going forward. We hope you won't be a stranger and no, uh, I'll see you more at some uh, I2N events, particularly when our new innovation hub yes. opens later in uh, in a few months' time. Um, Jennifer will be sticking around for a little bit for those of you in the room who want to um, have a uh, have a few questions they might want to ask. Um, but before we leave, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the events that we've got coming up as part of the Hunter Innovation Festival, which is on at the moment. Oops, sorry. Oh. So, so we have a, an event on this evening, uh, which is actually presented by Innovation and Entrepreneurship Society, which is all about students and startups. So there's three student entrepreneurs that are going to be speaking as part of a panel about their experience juggling study as well as establishing a, a company. Uh, so please do join us tonight here at uh, I2N Hub Hunter Street. Um, the next event that we've got, I don't know where I'm meant to be pointing this, sorry. Rich? Can you help me out? Oh, there we go. Is, oh, okay. So this might be interesting for some of you in the room. Um, Hunter Angels behind the scenes. So you'll be able to uh, join us next Monday at New Space, Monday evening. 
where the Hunter Angels, uh, unlike Shark Tank, will be um, hearing from three uh, local companies that are looking for angel investment. Uh, so it's essentially a closed in um, angels investment round, uh, pitch rather. Uh, and so you'll get some insight into the types of questions angels, angel investors ask of uh, companies that are coming to pitch to them at a very early stage. Um, and yeah, it's a really great way to also be introduced to some of the angel network in the region as well. Uh, very important for our ecosystem. So that's on Monday, 10th of May. And the next evening on Tuesday, the 11th of May, everyone always wants to know about intellectual property. It is uh, why we have intellectual property lawyers who are trained in this field, because it is very complex. Uh, but if you want to have your intellectual property 101 questions asked, what's the difference between a trademark and a patent and all those kinds of things, please join us with Davis Colson Cave on Tuesday, the 11th of May at New Space. And if you want to know more about the I2M programs that we offer, so we have Entrepreneurship 101, which is our online program um, for emerging entrepreneurs, Navigator for researchers, Validator, <clears throat> pardon me, Validator, which is our pre-accelerator program, and Incubator, which is our co-working with mentoring. Um, you can come along on, online on Thursday, the 13th of May, and find out more about those programs. Uh, and lastly, Initiate 48. So if you have an enterprising high schooler in your world, um, and you would, uh, they've got a business idea, something beyond maybe a lemonade stand, uh, and they would like assistance with uh, the guidance of some mentors to be able to produce a business plan within a weekend. Uh, Initiate 48 is the event for them. It's taking place at New Space on the 15th and 16th of May. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be there as well to help. Uh, really looking forward to that one. Uh, so that's it for our Hunter Innovation Festival events. If you'd like to know more about the Hunter Innovation Festival, please go to their website, hunterinnovationfestival.org. Uh, there's over 50 events taking place over the next two weeks. So I highly encourage you to dip in like you have today. Um, thank you again, Jennifer. Really appreciate your time. And thanks to everyone who's joined us in the room and online. I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you.